Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. The best way to do that is to follow me on X at at Focused Compound. Uh, if you're interested in getting access to investment wraps from Jeff going all the way back to 2005, go to FocusedCompound.com. And of course, if you want to learn more about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at FocusedCompounding.com. All that information is in the description below. So in today's podcast, Jeff, we're going to be going over a lot of different things. Uh, it's been a few okay. weeks since we last uploaded a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's been a little bit less than that since we last recorded a podcast. Uh, yep. <laughs> so we actually recorded a full hour and a half long podcast that did not get uploaded because um, I don't know if there were storms going on or what. We had internet internet connections and um, unfortunately we lost that. Uh, but... Uh, we are ready to roll with this here today, so hopefully we are good. So um, today is Thursday, August 8th, and uh, Monday, the futures, the markets were getting smoked. And okay. the buzzword that we were hearing a lot or the phrase that was talked a lot about both on CNBC and Twitter – and a bunch of different financial publications was the yen carry trade and how it somehow blew up. Uh, the Japanese stock market was down about 11% on uh, Sunday night into Monday morning in the United States and markets got smoked. So curious to hear your thoughts on everything that's going on, Jeff. Um, I had told you that I've heard a few different people talk about the yen carry trade over the past, I don't know, year and a half, couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, you had said that you think you've heard more about it uh, recently, but I think it's just yeah. people maybe I follow have been talking about it. Really people thinking that like, you know, one day it could blow up. It's almost like selling a premium way out of the money or something. It works a lot of the time, but when it doesn't, it could be catastrophic. So want to hear your thoughts on everything that's going on in the markets and we could go from there. Yeah. So I don't know what happened. Um, yen's a currency that basically doesn't yield anything. So if you're doing factory things that have basically trying to make money on stuff that goes sideways that doesn't have yield on it, like momentum things and, and other things and commodities and stuff like that. I think that it sometimes uses, um, uh, takes advantage of that and then it gets crowded. Right. So I don't know what there is to it other than it was probably very crowded for some reason, whether that's human beings or computers or human beings who are using things developed by computers or what, but it's your usual thing that way. Right. Um, but probably had something to do with a big change in expectations for interest rates in the short term in the United States, like that in a few months, the rates would come down a lot. That's the only thing I could think of that was a big shift that would cause things to happen in markets all around is just expectation of a much faster possibility of a recession, much faster possibility of large interest rate cuts. And so, you know, then there's differentials between um, yields in different countries and all that. And like, that's the thing that moved from what I can tell. I don't know what else would have moved that could have caused that all around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Macro has been uh, definitely a topic recently, whether we're in a recession, going in a recession, whether rates are going to come down, whether inflation is going to reignite. Um, you know, and of course, with everything going on in Japan, uh, it seemed to have really spooked the US markets. We had like a bit of this rotation trade going on where the Nasdaq was selling off and the Russell was going up and then, you know, jobless claims uh, came out and it was like, oh, no, actually, we're going into recession. So then the Russell, you know, pulled back on that because smaller companies are maybe more um, sensitive to, you know, like the economy and whether we're going to be in a recession or not. Uh, so want to zoom out, right? Because it's just been kind of crazy. And uh, just talk about, you know, just investing in general, uh, because so much of the conversation lately has been on uh, macro and a few just key stocks in the S&P 500. Uh, so pretty crazy. But, you know, when the Japanese stock market closed down 11 or 12%, whatever it was, I instantly started thinking about Buffett, obviously, because I think actually one of his 
positions that he owns in Japan was down like 20 or 30 percent in a day. Um, so lots of crazy stuff going on. I don't think these are normal times that we're living through, but I also have said that a lot over the past four to five years. So maybe this is the new normal. I don't know. Like, is that a product of like computers trading and stuff like that? You're going to get like these huge swings that, that happened in the market. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> so <laughs> we recorded a whole podcast where we talked about, you know, passive and, and all that. And basically what I said was like, look, it doesn't really matter passive and how big passive gets and everything as long as active and passive don't contaminate each other and um so that you know if if there was lots of passive that people who are actively trading weren't aware of and weren't involved with it doesn't matter because you still can develop um good uh uh like a, a you know you still have some people trying to figure out the actual values of things um mimicry is sort of the problem i mean i think on that podcast that we did <laughs> upload we also talked about ai and you, or it was maybe it was that one or a different one yeah. but you said like oh ai will get better and better over time and i said actually i think if the problem would happen that ai would start training on ai generated content on the internet eventually if we start to see a lot of that and it will devolve quickly into problems and it's the same sort of thing in markets so i i do worry about that with passive and just basically mimicry um, but it's not new to markets it's, humans have been capable of doing it themselves before. And, uh, it contributed to the 1980s, right? Where we had a, um, crash didn't last for a long time and everything, but it was a contributing factor was people using the same strategy. Um, there was a bond market problem in the UK, a bunch of companies and, and firms using the exact same strategy that was sold all around, you know, to everybody. Um, I remember, you know, housing market, a few firms being, you know, basically doing the same sort of thing. So I, I think that's always an issue and we just don't know how big that is, um, till we see what happens, but whenever there's something that's very crowded and doesn't have a strong fundamental reason for why people would stick with it, if they're kind of doing what everyone else is doing, they're going to freak out when it unwinds, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I had a long drive know, on Monday. Yeah. And uh, so I was listening to CNBC on the drive and I don't, I mean, I usually have CNBC on, uh, I don't really ever listen to it much, but it's just kind of on my computer, on my thinkorswim app or whatever. I don't ever just like sit and actually listen, you know, and pay attention mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but I had a long drive and it was Monday. So I was like, well, I'm just going to listen to CNBC. This is great. I have a long drive, but you know, I'm going to be pretty, um, you know, entertained today with everything going on and the amount of people that were coming on. And just saying the Fed needs to come out with an emergency cut and they need to cut by 50 basis points or they need to cut by 75 basis points. We need an emergency cut. This is Jay Powell's fault, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was just thinking, I'm like, man, the markets are so conditioned that there is like the Fed put, right? Or that they will come out mm -hmm. and, and stimulate. I mean, it was, the market was down, sure, 5% in a day or whatever. And we have come back down. If you're watching the screen right now, it looks like in July, the NASDAQ peaked right just under 24% year to date. Um, the S&P 500 was close to 20% year to date. And, you know, the NASDAQ's up 9% and the S&P is up 11%. This is just the price movement. So not taking in the dividends of the S&P 500. But I'm like, you know, zoom out and look at the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ over the past, you know, couple of years. And as soon as you get some sort of major correction, everyone just starts freaking out. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, I'm like, you know, if the Fed came out and did an emergency cut, my opinion is I actually think the market would sell off more because they'd be like, wait, actually something is fundamentally wrong here. You know, this is actually like a systemic issue. Um, but, you know, it's it's so interesting because I think, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, people always knew that the Fed was there to, you know, do different things. But it's like now it, it's obvious. Yes, the Fed is there and people start to freak out on a couple percentage moves, uh, uh, you know, to the downside, of course, not to the upside, but to the downside. And then people start to come out and start screaming, oh, no, they need to come out and, and cut rates immediately. And the Fed was they left rates low for too long. That's pretty obvious now, right? With inflation and everything. And they're going to do the other thing on the other side. Uh, but, yeah. you know, that's what creates cycles, right? <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, that's that's just that's just the way the cookie crumbles, you know? They don't like to switch gears quickly. 
They like yeah. to guide of a long time ahead of time. So they don't ever want to do, we just raised rates and now we're just cutting them. I don't see what the problem is with that. That's they're human beings. So you raised rates in one month and then you buy 25 base points and you cut them by 25 the next month, something changed, you change your mind, you know, but they're never going to want to do that. So they want to make it clear far enough ahead of time and, you know, all of that. And so it's kind of can be a little slow, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah so i mean expectations changed a lot i don't know what they look like now but they changed a lot for what we'll basically end the year at uh, in terms of where the fed funds rate will be and um they're probably too high and knew that anyway earlier in the year but then there is a drastic change in that so they probably knew that they should go down to like 150 basis points or something but over a long period of time and then the market was suddenly like, you need to cut 250 now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and, you know, and we're talking about intraday, like, you know, in the moment where these things are happening. Um, yeah. But if you just look at where inflation is and everything, then they're they're Yeah, they might be restrictive now for the first time in a while. So they would have known that and that they should gradually bring them down. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, I thought, I thought it was funny uh, because the Fed met last week. Right. I was like, could you imagine? So like uh, the previous Wednesday, um, could you imagine if Wednesday or Thursday, if, you know, Powell came out and said, no, they're going to leave rates unchanged. He had his press conference. And then the following Monday, he comes out and says, actually, we're going to have an emergency cut and we're going to cut by like 50 basis points. I mean, what changed between the, you know, the few days and Monday? I mean, nothing really other than, I guess, whatever right. was going on in Japan. Uh, but so far, it doesn't seem like the markets have really nothing has really come out of it yet um so very interesting and of course the jobs number came out today and and jobs are a little bit stronger so people are like oh i guess we're actually not going to go into a recession it gets it sounds like the soft landing is back on the table it seems to change every single uh, couple of days <laughs> yeah but i mean you you are inverted right to some extent not drastically but you're inverted unemployment the yield curve have been somewhat rising and inflation had been somewhat falling. All of those would say that you should strongly indicate you should be cutting rates. But it's like, we'll do that in six months or something because we had such a long time of telling people that we were going to raise rates. So it just it takes a long time for them to switch up on that. Um, you know, uh, most of them don't do that. Greenspan was the only one I think that really did that. Look ahead, see what's happening, adjust all the time. That was more his mantra than any of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So recession talk, obviously, I've, people have been talking about it. I did tweet out uh, a few days ago that Chapter 11 filings have reached their highest level in over a decade. I thought that was interesting. Uh, so for people listening, a good place to look for value. You could you know, source these different situations from like Toff Capital, which we've spoken about on the podcast before. Stocks emerging from bankruptcy. Um, you know, it's going to be a good pond to fish and we've spent some time there. We look at a lot of different things, but since we've been investing together, I think only one situation, right, um, is one that we actually invested in. That we actually um, invested in, probably, yeah. Yeah. But why do you like to focus on this? And somebody actually had asked, is there any evidence, white papers, et cetera, on this being a good place to look for value? And I don't know if there are. It's it's really hard to <laughs> to aggregate data, and a lot of mm -hmm. uh, these situations are super complicated. And you're dealing with the legal system, and every situation is different. Uh, so I hope there are no white papers, or you know that people aren't going to do more research on this because I don't want this pocket of the market to end up like spinoffs, <laughs> and where you yeah. know now there's just nowhere to look for value. So um, you know it's good I think in investing sometimes where you don't need evidence of returns, uh, especially if you have success in that area, right? Yeah, and I like looking at spinoffs, IPOs, Chapter 11, whatever these things that you're talking about, because you can value the entire company and then see what it will look like when it comes out. Now, IPOs are like the opposite of Chapter 11. Everyone wants them, so they tend to get overpriced. Um, spinoffs for a time were pretty good, and there may be opportunities in that. They, You know, the thing probably with Chapter 11 is similar to spinoff. If you look at it, whatever the papers say, I would suggest looking at an actual breakdown of you know websites that track it for each stock that it's been because they are wildly different depending on, uh, you know, their performance is wildly different stock by stock. So when we're talking about the mean and the median and everything, it can really disguise that. 
in a paper, but also sometimes you could know some of those things ahead of time by really analyzing the business and, and everything. And I would say the same thing with chapter 11. I wouldn't just encourage people to go out and buy anything that is emerging from that. And there's plenty of companies that, you know, end up going back into chapter 11, um, too. And because there's things wrong with them as a, as a business. Uh, but there's not many things that are underpriced, unloved, etc. So you got to look really hard these days for all that. And mm -hmm. that's one place to look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about Buffett. Um, sold half of his position in Apple. If you yeah. listen to the Berkshire annual meeting this year, he sort of hinted that they were going to continue yeah. to sell stock. Yeah. Um, he basically said, I'm going to sell a ton of Apple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he, he, his um, like, exact quote was something like, I foresee it being our biggest or one of our biggest positions for yeah. a long time or something. And if you look at the math on that, that's like, okay, so he could sell like 50 to 90% or something. Yeah. And we actually spoke yeah. about that on the podcast where like, yeah. yeah, the way he phrased it was, yeah, we'll still oh, be, yeah. it'll still be the largest position and we'll be the largest shareholder or whatever. But it was like, well, you got yeah. a long way to sell uh, for that still to be true. I want to get your, your take on this because obviously a lot of people on Twitter were speculating on why he was doing this. He, I believe, holds more treasury bills than the Federal Reserve right now. His cash hoard is incredibly high. Like what are your take? Bills, short term, yeah, yeah because yeah. the Fed's not very short term. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And he also <laughs> more sold out some Fed. <laughs> yeah, right. Sold out some Bank yeah. of America as well. And we were together last week, and your yeah. take on this mm -hmm. was different than everyone else's take that I saw on oh, the internet. Okay. So I would like to well, chat about that here. Uh, why you uh -oh. think he's selling well, my these positions? Take. I mean, well, I you... think he's selling them down because of his age and yes. that he's afraid to have someone inherit these two positions because they're they're things he might have held in 2000 or something. If he knew like they're the Coke and Gillette, you know, of today, he doesn't want to saddle those people with positions that he wouldn't buy for the first time. Now, he might have bought these five or 10 years ago. But these are he doesn't want them to inherit those positions. And so I think he's going through and eliminating positions because of his age, because he's not going to be around forever to not burden them with positions that he, you know, so they have to make the decision to sell as soon as he does. Whereas with Oxy or something, that's a new position for him. He's happy to keep buying it. He wouldn't be buying Apple or Bank of America. And he pretty much said those publicly. I mean, Bank of America, he was like, well, it was a special deal and whatever, but we sold our other bank things, you know. So I think he's trying not to make the mistake he made in the 2000s. Um, and I think he's okay with that, but if he was going to have someone inherit from him in 2000, I think he would have sold Coke and Gillette. I don't think he would have forced those on them if he knew that in 2001 or two or something, someone was going to take over for him. Mm -hmm. So what are other people's take? So that's, that's not the, no, no, most people one? think, okay. yeah, that he's going to do a big deal or, or market timing or oh, stuff okay. like that. Yeah. Uh huh. And you were the only one that said, well, actually maybe he just doesn't want somebody else to inherit these huge positions. Um, yeah. that he put on because yeah, now I think he's, he's got been like, doing what, a lot of thinking about cash that. or something like that. Yeah. I do think there's been a lot of thinking about that probably at Berkshire, just the way that he talked at the annual meeting, um, you know, Charlie dying, I think too. Um, but like, um, that they wouldn't manage the entire, you know, that Todd and Ted wouldn't manage, you know, 200 some billion dollars or whatever it'll end up being. Um, and I think they, a decade ago, they, he did think that. So I think his thinking has changed in terms of the size of what Berkshire's gotten to be, in terms of the fact that their investment portfolio, I mean, uh, that he couldn't find anything. I think he was holding out hope that, you know, he'd get another, uh, you know, not necessarily a 2008 type thing, but something where prices would look attractive again. And I don't know that he has much hopes that he'll get to see that at his age. Mm -hmm. Um and I think he wants to make sure that Berkshire's positioned the right way for that. So not to saddle people with giant. I mean, how big was the Apple position? We're talking like in billions. I mean, you know, that's, let's see. It's whole end of second quarter. 84.2 billion is what it was at the end of the second quarter. And, it, uh, and he sold than more that, than, so, yeah. yeah, he sold more than 49% of the stake. So. Yeah. So <laughs> we're talking a hundred something billion. I don't remember the exact amount, but it's just, you know, um, yeah, and it probably, you know, like your Coke and stuff, is not something he expects to do great. And so do you want to give like 50% or something of your portfolio to someone into something that's really overvalued? Mm -hmm. I think he could justify it more to himself, although I think he knows that it wasn't great to keep the Coke and stuff in 2000. 
Um, but he could justify it more to himself if he's the one who has to deal with it. I don't think he wants to leave it to someone else to deal with. Mm-hmm. That would be my guess. Mm-hmm. So what do you think he'll do with the cash, right? So the article says $277 billion, It's earning, uh, you know, uh, it's earning some money um, uh, from uh, the treasury bills. I mean, someone was like, do we have a huge special dividend incoming? Uh, do you think he's just going to let it sit on the balance sheet? What do you think? I mean, unless you find a $220 billion <laughs> thing to buy, I mean, yeah. you're not going to use it all up. And they produce cash over time, too. So even if he wants to keep, say, $50 billion in cash, which is possible at this point, Berkshire's big, um, I don't think you want to keep much more than that. And there's not a lot out there. What's a company that's $200 billion or something that you could buy the entire thing? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You can't do it in the stock market because to buy a two hundred billion dollars, it's two trillion dollars probably because you're not going to buy more than ten percent in the market. Yeah. So, you know, that's a handful of companies um, that are in, in two trillion. That's almost no companies. You know, it really is. We could name them, and then um, even a couple hundred billion is really big, and they have to be willing to sell to you if you're going to buy the whole company. So, mm-hmm. it would be hard. I can't really even think about what companies would be that size in the United States that would be possible there's there's almost no private companies that are that size it's it depends you know they've had and and those that are anywhere near that he's had dealings with in the past or something like um they wouldn't be new things that he's never heard of uh mm-hmm. you know so like yeah would he at one day like to buy you know Mars Wrigley whatever stuff yeah probably something like that or, or whatever but you know I don't think they're planning to sell, right? Mm-hmm. And everything else you can see is public companies. There's there's not, you know, pretty much if it's two, if we're talking about a couple hundred billion dollars, those are public companies you could look up and and see. And a lot of big companies are really small compared to that. So, yeah, I don't know how they're ever going to use that money. Mm-hmm. So how much in interest is he earning then on that $277 billion? Well, if he's in three months and stuff, what is it at five point three percent? Five? I don't know what the three month, uh, you know, ninety days or less is, but that's what he means. So if it looks like thir- equivalent, so it has thirteen to, to fourteen billion. Days. Yeah, it has to be under ninety days. And what's that uh, capitalized at? Like you know, ten times or fifteen times or something? You know, from like a market <laughs> value perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not yeah, bad. but if you, but obviously, if you put it longer term, things is less. I don't know what. 10 or 30 year bond pretend what's 10 year bond at four percent mm, yeah probably something like that so um you know he's earning more than the fed because the fed has less well the fed has some things that aren't government stuff i guess but he's earning more than a lot of people are you have to keep in mind too because he's shorter term than everyone else he's more liquid in earning higher rates yeah 10 years at four because rates are higher on the short term than the long yeah mm-hmm. crazy 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 what do you think? What are your predictions for the future with everything going on right now in the economy, in the markets? We're still kind of at all time highs, right? Yes, we're off a little bit, mm-hmm. but is this really just a a correction on our way higher? I mean, is uh you know Nvidia going to go and come back down to earth? You know, what are your thoughts? What are your predictions? Uh, I I don't have a lot of predictions. I think things are very expensive. If anything ever happens that is negative things can drop pretty fast because everyone's expectations have to be of uh you know really good outcome right now uh uh-huh. but you Are know you finding anything that's cheap time. in the small cap world no. no 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 i mean not nothing but like you know uh, there are things if they get overlooked uh so i think Year to date, Cinemark is up like 80%, right? And Marcus is down like 10% or something. Uh-huh. So there are just random things like that where two stocks that are pretty similar. Um, Marcus has a hotels business too, and Cinemark 83%. is a pure operator. <laughs> yeah. But what's Marcus? MCS, Marcus. Yeah. Down 11%. That's a so that's wild insane. dispersion. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. But that's what happens too. And this is why I've warned about the pair trading and stuff. Like you could look and at some point this year, you'd say, what these, why would this keep going up and this one not go? This one's cheaper. I want, and it'll just get worse and worse. That's what happens to value investors in these bubbles at the end where they think, oh, I'll buy the cheaper one and short the more. Even if you like Cinemark, you'd be like, oh, I could short Cinemark and go long market. No, nope. just mm-hmm. makes it worse and worse as you go. What's the logic to it? I don't know. One's in something. <laughs> 
it's bigger, it's in indexes, I don't know, who knows. Mm -hmm. There's some logic to it that has to deal with what it is as a stock, and that's why it's happening probably. There could mm -hmm. be some underlying things that people could argue. You can always come up with a narrative. It's it's hard to come up with a narrative for explaining why one's up 80% and one's down 10%, you know. That's pretty tough. These are really, really similar. Like really good comps for each other on the on the um, movie theater side. Really well, somebody good. yeah on the movie theater side, but then Marcus oh, has yeah. the, totally. the hotels and commercial real estate. So you yeah. have a pure play in Marcus and then a pure play in Cinemark and then I guess not so much in Marcus. but And, and the box Correct. office is done well over the past month or so so oh, yeah i'm not arguing with twisters that. yeah but what but are we saying like people are so negative on hotels that the, it's like a, they're ascribing a large negative value to it they would have like how do you explain that kind of difference between the two uh-huh that's what you kind of have to say is it something like oh hotels are so terrible that yeah unless there's you know but there's also just like eh, you know maybe people don't look at um what the numbers at each one are and are just like, look, I want the peer play. I don't want the hotels thing. I want that. You know, that happens too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in a bubble type thing, you don't, you're not really thinking about people aren't looking at the numbers and stuff. They're looking at, at stories about things and how things are moving and everything. And then also just the momentum things and stuff. Maybe that affects it. These are high volatility stocks normally, right? Like they've gotten very high betas for some reason over time. So we've talked about that with airlines, movie theaters, whatever, oil companies, um, except for big blue chip ones have that too. And, um, so some of them get really attractive as, uh, for like momentum type stuff. Right. And these things don't really have much in the way of yield or anything like they used to have, you know? Mm -hmm. So they used to look like different kinds of companies, uh, different kinds of stocks. They, the companies are the same, but they may show up as kind of looking different as stocks, I guess than they used to um because they used to have value and yield and you know they, like they showed up i mean they're the ex the companies didn't change so it's it's silly to talk about it this way but like if you were literally screening the stock the fact that it doesn't pay a dividend or something like it used to exactly you know so and, and um and also, again, like it might not look as cheap on present day stuff, but that's kind of dumb because like 2026, let's say, will be a good year. And, you know, people can look ahead and everything. So I also don't know. I think Cinemark has way more annual covers than Marcus and everything. And maybe there's other reasons, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could look at Marcus, right? Obviously, we've followed the company on here. Uh, a few different times, but current market cap four hundred four million, enterprise value five hundred thirty six million, price to sales point six, EBIT sales point eight, ten year median margins on EBIT about ten percent. Um, if you look at where this company was at pre twenty twenty, you're talking pretty regularly, at least for a handful of those years, at least seventy million in operating profit, right? Um, at an EV right now of 536 million, if you get back to, let's say pre 2020 levels, this thing's pretty cheap, you know, and that's just, um, the business itself. Can think or swim or whatever you're using there do a longer term chart, like five years or longer. Yeah, no. So we're using quite fin, but we could do, Koifin, uh, okay. yeah. Do you want 10 years? Here's 10 year chart. Got yeah, 20, got all, if you chart the you two want, against Jeffrey. each other. Yeah. I just w would just say that i think there's more of a divergence than you might have expected uh -huh. um in recent uh results let's see where we have here so the yellow is marcus so, and blue is cinemark okay and and how far back do we go there that's 10 right yeah mm -hmm. we could go 20 yeah yeah so uh but if you go back like five years or something um you'll see that you, there you go mm -hmm. so this is what i meant it's just this five year it's pretty good indication of that what happened? that's wild <laughs> that is wild <laughs> even if you so look at what, that look at i mean 2020 obviously everything jumped out but like look at the bottom of 2020 october 2020 i mean these things traded like neck and neck with each other and then the pull because we have box and office like that. data every week they should be we, yeah. we know what it is Eddie. i mean like this is so yeah um and then they just so what month is that so that's early Okay, when is that? So the, where did they start diverging? It was back 
a little before April was that? It looks Wait, like February. That? Yeah, February. February, okay. And then it just February twenty third. You know, which is fine. Cinemark cheap, good stock, but like I what it got some momentum or something. It showed up on something that this is it's value with momentum now, so you gotta go for it, and the other ones just value with no momentum. But they're this they're not like they can't really be that different. Like, you know, does have the hotels thing yes cinemark does have latin american things i can give you a little bit on that but the circuits are so similar in in the united states and just uh they're so similar Uh, these are very very comparable businesses and and that's great if you own cinemark that's terrific but one of the things that happens there is people who own marcus probably feel like oh i made a mistake or something people have own Cinemark think I've made a great decision. I don't think we should take seriously anything that happened between the two in the last six months. Like something will happen. I don't know what, but that is really wow. Yeah, this so, is a six month chart right now. So for people yeah. listening, Cinemark's up about eighty percent over the past six months, and Marcus is down five point six. If you look at a three year chart, <laughs> Cinemark's up sixty five percent. Marcus is down um, about seventeen percent. Uh, let's see, five year chart. Well, they both you know suck. Even uh, the five year, you can 30%. see that they used to huge divergence. Yeah, yeah, they used That's to track funny. very closely, and then there's a big divergence. So, uh, I'm going to tweet this out. I'm going to ask people <laughs> what the uh, the divergence is here between these, and then we'll we'll bring this back up on the next podcast. We'll just okay. read everybody's response. What do you think people are going to say? I bet you people will reference Marcus um, having exposure to hotels. Mm-hmm. And Cinemark not, Cinemark being a pure play. Um, it'll be interesting to see if anyone talks about like the momentum factor that you just referenced. My That's guess is, is not really. Okay. Yeah. I think that most people today don't want to own a value stock unless it's moving. For some reason, something randomly started moving. And so then we all crowd into the thing that's moving and not the other one. But it could be. But like this to me is when we talk about the yen carry trade or any of those things. To me, it's more like this. It's like eh, a trend reinforced itself. I don't know why. We can come up with a narrative. That's why Cinemark's amazing and Marcus is is terrible. And there was an exact date that like, it's not like it gradually happened either. If you look at this, it's like, <laughs> no, there <yeah>. it is. <laughs> I just think February it started 26. moving and yeah. some people and computers and things said, here's something cheap and the future is good and it's on the move and I want to own it now. Whereas when it was before, they said it's a cheap movie theater stock. Yeah, 2025 will be better than 2024. 2026 will be better than 2025. Okay, it's a value stock. Okay, but I don't want to own it till it starts moving. Now it started moving, and now I'm in. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're a large fund though, and you are investing in theaters, or you're bullish on you know the box office for the next couple of years, I mean, you're not going to buy Marcus. You're just going to go for the and, and then so it, it's got to it probably and, is momentum factor, and it makes it worse because now its size is by market cap. So because of that, you almost, on a relative basis, it remember, it doubled because it's up 80. The other one's down 10. That's a doubling in terms of its size and any index weightings and things. Not that there are a lot of indexes. And Marcus doesn't have a lot of float. And so there's there's other things like that. But Cinemark is definitely the one that's more likely that it, if something were to people to get excited about it, Cinemark is more capable of taking excitement from institutions and having that translate to a higher price than Marcus would be. But I'm saying these are like, to me, you know, Marcus is a control company and there's and all that. But to me, these these are the difference between a stock factor and like a business factor. I think it's hard to come up with real business factor explanations for why that would happen when it happened. Um, and it's not like they are always 100 percent married. You can see that there is a little bit there where there was a divergence where uh, before. I mean, I can only find one and. I mean, this is only the second time in five years that we see anything that looks at all like things are slightly moving differently for even a period of a few months. So anyway, I just find it fascinating. But I think that if we were more knowledgeable about lots of different businesses and watching everything all around the world, we would be able to find more examples of this, of like, why is this happening, you know? And um, that's very 2000s reminiscent to me. Why is Electronic Arts doing this and Activision doing that? Who knows? It's one's become a name that people are into now and the other one isn't. And that was a very 2000s thing that like stocks, not just industries and stuff, but particularly favored stocks and, and things. And and some of that is just like a broader concept of momentum and all of that, I think. But also the passive things we talked about. What about the passive things? 
well, how big is Cinemark as a market cap versus Marcus now? It, it's it's a lot bigger because yeah, I mean it's like, I mean, in terms of float and stuff, it's like ten times or something, right? It, it's big because in terms of market cap, before they were, um, it was only it was about four times by market cap, I think, before Cinemark was bigger than Marcus, but then you know, um, we had the divergence that we just talked about now. And then also there's a float issue. It's not huge, but there is a float issue where there's more economic ownership um, in Marcus, although it's mostly voting ownership. But mm -hmm. Let's actually tweet this out right now. We could go over it on the thing. <laughs> What's going on with this divergence between CNK and Marcus? Yeah. Let's see. Do we do that? What's going on with this? Okay. So you can get an instantaneous this. answer. You should ask Chad yeah. GPT what, why they're diverging. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's pull the screenshot. There we go. Okay. Let's see what people say about it. <laughs> I mean, do you think Marcus is a good place to, uh, or, or it's a good time to invest? I mean, look at the only other times, the few other times that there was a divergence. It wasn't this big and the gap did close. Um, yeah, I think it's good. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. What's going on with this diverge between CNK and MCS? Yeah, we'll see what people say about that. Uh, the question, actually, that somebody had sent in was about Marcus. Uh, they had oh, emailed okay. it to you. And um, we didn't know that we were going to bring it up. We just, by chance, started chatting about it. Uh, let's see. The person says he recently invested in Marcus. I've tried to value movie theaters and hotels separately. I arrived at a similar outcome. To that of your write-up, where you attempted to value Marcus Hotels by looking through transactions in the industry for hotels similar to the ones Marcus owns. So that post was from 2020, I believe. Mm -hmm. If you go back to Focus Compound, type in Marcus, that's when we last uh, did that and went through and, and valued a bunch of different hotels and stuff, right? So this does get to a big factor that he's talking about there, where if you value it as a sum of the parts and you put a very low EBITDA multiple, on hotels and very high on, uh, I mean, very high on hotels and very low on movie theaters, which was not the case, say, 10 years ago or something. If you looked at how people appraised them, it would be more similar multiples. But if you do that, then it, it does kind of make it like the weighting of Marcus versus Cinemark is it's way more weighted to hotels. But if you look at it from the perspective of um, the actual EBITDA of where it's coming from, you know, Marcus is, is not as much of a hotel company as people might think. So... It can happen for that reason, I guess. But that's weird. I mean, hotels are more susceptible to recession than movie theaters, big time. But lower rates are also good for hotels, whereas they're not that helpful for movie theaters. So you're much more economically protected in a movie theater than a hotel thing. But it's not a big deal. It's they're not a bad credit risk or anything, Marcos. So, so the question that he had sent in was: the individual said, "I can't wrap my head around." Uh, why hotels trade at such high multiples? He said, I believe you mentioned in your podcast recently that you think hotels have been expensive historically relative to movie theaters. And I totally agree. Hotel REITs trade at 10 to 12 times even EBITDA. Individual transactions are, are done at similar multiples, if not more. Marcus recently sold, recently sold a 225 room hotel in Oklahoma at a 13.6 times 2019 EBITDA multiple, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then he asked, why do you think a cyclical asset like hotels where revenue and profitability tends to drop in downturns and an asset that requires constant maintenance trades at such low yields? Question mark, when you approach valuing a company like Marcus, would you value hotels as what the industry values them or think of them in terms of a DCF? Question mark. Given that the hotels that Marcus likely won't be sold, I tend to favor the second method that doesn't come out to anything better than 12 times free cash flow as opposed to 12 times EBITDA, but that value derives substantially from how the market values them. So he's really just talking about how do you think about valuing uh, Marcus as it relates to the fact that they have hotels, but then more so a larger question of why do you think cyclical assets like hotels uh, tend to trade at higher valuations. Is that just because they don't have a ton of free cash flow or is it more of an asset thing? What is that? Well, I would value them based on the free cash flow. So like you said, a DCF. Um, I think because there's a private market for hotels, whereas there isn't lately for movie theaters, right? So people can't comp it to something that's a private transaction. They're seeing what it trades for in the market. And so they see it move all the time that way. And, and it's however popular it is that way. Um, you know, 
I, I don't really know the logic of it exactly. I mean, I think hotels could be seen as a super durable asset and like other real estate that way. And so, it, you know, it, it's not crazy that they could be seen as um, a better um, having a higher multiple than than hotels, uh, the hotels than movie theaters. But yeah, I mean, I would rather think that generates more cash over time. Movie theaters aren't seen as being very durable, obviously, and hotels are. So hotels trade more in line with, you know, apartment buildings or something. I guess you could think of them that way, where you feel like there's total durability to the asset class, whereas you don't with movie theaters. That would be a good explanation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So people responded to the <laughs> tweet. It says, uh, yeah, real time right here. <laughs> Customer trends preferring IMAX, where which is also public company. True. We spoke yes, about that's that. absolutely true. Um, Marcus doesn't do IMAX. 100% true. Why is that? Because it's it's cheaper for them not to do IMAX. And I think that that's potentially an issue. But I should point out, it's not like they have worse screens. They have plenty of great screens. They just aren't using IMAX technology and paying IMAX royalties on it. That's the decision that they made. Is that the right decision? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I agree with them in the long run with that because I think there's some risks to that, that whether IMAX is or isn't better screens, better technology that you're going to have, it's easy for people to know the brand name. IMAX invests a lot in the brand name, getting, you know, your Christopher Nolans and stuff to talk about that they film in IMAX and everything. And um, so saying that you have premium large format screens is not the same thing as saying you have IMAX. Um, so was that a mistake that they made? Maybe, but they then make more money and paying less out because of it. So we don't know all the details of those deals, but you give up money when you make a deal with IMAX where they get a big cut of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it says that uh, as it relates to the IMAX, uh, Cinemark has the upper hand. Marcus noticeably underperformed when Dune 2 came out. Yeah, but Marcus is a Midwestern uh, thing. It'll overperform with Twisters, right, versus Cinemark. Dune 2 is a very uh, – yeah. Dune 2 is not for Midwesterners. It's not for red state no. people. No. Uh, Twisters is. Dune 2 isn't. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, number two, he said CNK has exposure to the Latin America market where movie watching yep. trends are arguably better. Mm -hmm. So that was one of them. Uh, and then the other one, Marcus losing theater market share and Cinemark gaining it. Also, maybe investors are worried about Marcus hotel and lodging business in a recession. Yes. But, agree, but again, I agree true. divergence shouldn't be this wide. Yeah. The hotel thing makes a lot of sense. Sure. Uh -huh. The, the oh, gaining the and losing avocado movie theater. capital, he gave more reasons too. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sure. I was going to say the gaining and losing of market share is tricky because, it, you know, different movies come out at different times. So you have to be careful. You know, like um, like where I, I used to live was the biggest theater for Twisters in the country. The cut there, which is Cinemark one. So that's big. But that's not normally the case. Usually, you know, a New York or L.A. theater or something is your biggest. So it depends on what movies are coming out. So that's always going to be a case. Like, I know they polled people coming out of Civil War, the A24 movie, because okay. there was, they wanted to figure out their, um, like, political leanings, right? But it's not that good of a poll because anyone who watches an A24 movie is going to lean more left than right anyway. It really doesn't have to do with the fact that it was a movie that was political that might've contributed to it, but you have an indie movie like that. You're always going to have a real skew. An A24 movie is not going to play in like Iowa, the way that it plays in New York or something. So, um, yeah. And you saw Dune 2, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Dune, Dune 2 is not a lot of talking, very moody, yeah. very beautiful. That's the director that you have there. It's one of his more accessible movies, actually, because some of his others are even not so much for general audiences. But yeah, that's not that's not the same as as Deadpool and Wolverine or something. You know, it's placed to a different mm -hmm. audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other reasons he gave, he said, Mark is pushing cash from movies to hotel capex versus Cinemark likely re-implementing dividend policy after debt level stabilize, and then four, Cinemark is more liquid. No big players going to touch family owned Marcus. Marcus is definitely cheap, but I could see why some people would avoid it. Yeah. And I think all those are possible reasons. Huge divergence, though. <laughs> well, it's just interesting because it's not like I'm saying there's a price divergence that's existed for a long period of time. There got to be a big divergence in a short period of time. Like something seems to have happened there. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yeah. but so I wonder that. But, but so if this was instead of Marcus and Cinemark, 
this was, you know, the yen and the, you know, pick another currency or something, we'd come up with some wild explanations of why this must be happening to two things that otherwise should be similar. And I don't always know if if that's true or just something happened with trends. I think any of those things might explain why something started to happen in the first place, but it looks to me like it was some self-reinforcement there of the trading activity in the stock itself then reinforced things about it. It's hard to believe that that was a narrative that caught on and if people didn't see the stock moving, it would behave the same way. I kind of feel like it. this just... I see that. So when you say, are there things that are cheap or something? Yeah, but they're the things that people won't want that way because they're the things that are, you know, if you look at that chart, most people are going to want the one that started to move in that correct direction, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a worrying sign if yeah. the thing you're most comparable to is going up like that and you're not. What's wrong with you? You know, mm -hmm. there must be mm -hmm. something that I'm missing, right? So now what for Marcus then? What are some, I mean, it, at these price levels, it sounds like you think it's pretty cheap and it's definitely something. Uh, yeah. And I'm not saying at. the Cinemark is expensive. I mean, I have to look at exactly what's happened since it went up by that amount, but, um, but it was cheap for a while and not moving. And then it moved faster than it got, you know, business did not improve 90% or what 80% or whatever for Cinemark in that period of time. Um, Yeah. So that's just what happens with stocks. Sometimes they lag, sometimes they're fundamentals, and then other times they race ahead of them. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's still nowhere near where it was before or anything. And, you know, um, I'm just pointing out a divergence between two things that are awfully similar. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think that's... Um, I mean... <sighs> Let's look at quick FS probably has it. What's the share turnover, which I think is a large explanation for why this happens in stocks like this. 523%. Okay. And then Marcus. In Cinemark. In Cinemark. Let's compare yeah. it to Marcus. Marcus is at, oh, 708%. Yep. So um, if you look at volume, we could just look at volume recently too. That's a good indication. So if we go to Cinemark, I um, mean, yeah, OTC markets will be fine. That'll give it to us. Uh, volume today when recording this is 3 million, right? Okay. So I, I don't, I don't think a lot of people want to just be in Marcus for the long term or be in Cinemark for the long term. So if you don't want to be in a stock for the long term, then, you know, you want stuff to be happening now and you start to focus more on what's happening now, I think, than just like, it's not enough for it to be cheaper. We, we've talked about this with value things. Like, is it enough for something just to be cheap? I don't know. Um, <laughs> That's not how uh, the machines are programmed, Jeff. They like momentum. They like inflections. They like numbers that are incrementally getting better year over year, quarter over quarter, and moving to the upside. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and the way it works, too, is this stuff becomes self-reinforcing because some of these just go on price, too, right? So they're just buying the thing that's working, <laughs> you know? So if it's working, uh, the price is going up. Yeah, and I don't know how how some it. of these things work that we're talking about. That's way beyond what I'm capable of understanding. But I I think some are as simple as if it if something moves up strongly after earnings, then that's a sign that things are positive there, and that can be fed into how you're uh, in, into what makes a good stock versus not a good stock. But that's tricky because that's not exactly the same thing as knowing whether earnings were good or not. It's you're taking everyone else's assessment of it, you know and then deciding what to do about it based on that. But you're basically saying, okay, they beat or something because I saw that the stock rose a bunch after that. So there's interesting ones like that. We've talked about that off the air about some that fascinate me where they have all their up moves after on news and earnings and stuff. And then when there's no news, they go down, you know, even if the trend is to be fairly flat or up each quarter, you can see this pattern that it's up constantly on news and then it's down smaller amounts all the time when there's no news. And so it's mostly evening out that way, but it is fascinating that it's net that there are stocks that are almost never down with news or, and are, but yet manage to be down because they go down on all days where there isn't news basically. Yeah. So <laughs> to me, that's, that's odd. Right. But again, it's with something that is no one is holding on to, right. It's just being churned so much. So 
it's whatever you know that's like george soros type stuff is alchemy of finance what was his book about reflexivity yeah yeah yep sure okay. yeah a lot of these things are reflexive yeah. yeah so that's way beyond you know what i think we can really cover in a podcast um with having much interesting stuff to say about it but there's just there's some things that are more about the stock as a stock i think sometimes than about the stock as a business mm-hmm mm-hmm what are your thoughts on the box office? Did Deadpool exceed your expectations? I mean, we had spoken about before. We didn't know how well it could do because it was a rated R movie. Um, uh, I, I said the best comp for it was uh, Doctor Strange and the um, uh, Multiverse of Madness. So that probably did $185 million or something opening domestic. Um, and Deadpool and Wolverine, did it finish at 210 205 Where was it? It's, I think it was projected at 205 and maybe finish at 210 or something. Um, so it did better. Yeah. Um, worldwide box office, 903 million. Yeah. Well, that's big. Yeah. It will be a, it will definitely, I don't know if it'll make a billion two, a billion four. I don't know what it'll do exactly, but it'll be big. I mean, it's going to be about double the other two, probably, it, you know, Deadpool two and Deadpool, they probably only made 700 something worldwide. I would bet. Uh, 750, 740, I don't know. So uh, I'd be surprised if they made a lot more than that. So we're talking about something that's almost going to be up 100% from that. But, now, but why is that? Is that because of the crossover with yeah. Wolverine? Wolverine is yeah. one of the most popular characters. And play, I mean, Hugh Jackman is not, ex we don't really have movie stars anymore, but Hugh Jackman's awfully close to being a movie star. And Wolverine's like Spider Man. It's a character that's in a league of its own in terms of um, pop culture and everything. So. Now, if you did it again, would it be as big? No, but it's closest to, uh, what was it, No Way Home? Is that the one I'm thinking of? Uh, where they have the three Spider-Men team up, right? So if you kept doing that, it's not going to work every time, but it's a sequel that had, so this is a third sequel in that. So the Spider-Man, that was kind of the third sequel too. That uh, third movie, that standalone. And uh, you introduce something that's totally new, but also plays to the nostalgia of the last 25 years and has the actual actors from it. Yeah, that's that's really big. Yeah, I mean, if you ever did a James Bond movie where somehow you figured out a way to have, you know, three living actors or something who have played the role all appear in the same one somehow, yeah, it would probably make it bigger. But since you can't do that, Marvel can with multiverses and things, but most <laughs> can't come up with a reason that they can do that, um, you're, you're always going to have um, bigger uh, numbers from that. So it was impressive. But like we said, it was, you know, it was within 10%, uh, 20% or whatever, maybe outperformed 10 or 20% what I said was likely. We thought it was going to be the biggest movie of the year. It, domestically, it will not be. Probably worldwide, it will not be because Inside Out, I don't think anything can beat Inside Out too. What are you excited for for the rest of the year? Do you think uh, Alien will do well? No. <laughs> but it, it will... Beetlejuice could do well i don't know that's one that could break out but i also said you could have fury road or whatever break out so who knows but yeah beetlejuice is one that um is the same thing where it's a giant uh it's a huge time uh between the movies right but if they're pitching it kind of like it's a kid's movie and then the kid's parents are the ones who actually like beetlejuice and know what that is so that's what they're going for there. Um, it's perhaps a little too long. You want to maybe go back to something that's, you know, we're in a point where it should be like 90s to 2000 nostalgia, not, you know, this is a little old, you know. It was the same thing with The Flash where Michael Keaton was in that one. Going back to Batman 89 or, or whatever, the, the um, it's a little old. It was better to do the Spider-Man ones where it's going back to, you know, uh, and an X-Men too. Actually, Spider-Man and X-Men are pretty close in terms of when they came out, the, you know, both of them, the original ones. So yeah, going back 25 years for your nostalgia, it works pretty well. John Huber responds saying, I think there is no real explanation other than a mispricing. <laughs> NCS also got booted from one of the passive indices earlier this year. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. But we see what we want to see because I think John is more of a fundamentals investor too, probably. So, uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Interesting. 
Well, Marcus, then I guess a uh, good time for people listening uh, to do some research on on the company. You do have the box office uh, strengthening into 2025 20, uh, and 2026. So you should get a couple of good years out of that. Um, mm-hmm. You've had a couple of good uh, blockbuster movies come out recently. Yeah. When's and, Avatar I mean, coming out? Is that next year? Uh, oof, who knows? Um, th- there are some yeah, updates on something. I, James in, Cameron. 2026 is very, very strong, I would say, right now. But the caveat with that, right, is it looks strong now, but people's tastes can change, and this is why this always happens. What's greenlit now sounds like a good idea, and then by the time you get there, you go, ooh, those things are off trend now, and you know, because it takes so long. So if we were looking at Barbie and Oppenheimer and everything, we wouldn't say, oh, this looks so amazing. And if we were looking at a bunch of superhero movies not that long ago we would have said oh blue beetle and this and that that's okay they'll do fine you know but then there's just less appetite for that by the time the movie actually comes out so but years ahead of time we'd say oh yeah that'll do great that'll just be another superhero one that'll do fine um so the summer right now the summer of 2026 is like overpacked with things whereas we've been under with uh most of the ones that that we have um so there's some adjustments too. We I like I mentioned the Spider-Man thing. I have no idea if there even will be a Spider-Man by then. There's one date that could be possible if there is going to be one, but it's not announced. And um, so be a Sony one, you know, one of those is what I mean. And uh, obviously there was things with Marvel where they're going to do uh, uh, Doctor Doom stuff. So that could be big too. Um, but we're talking a couple years from now, basically. But 2025 could be better than 2024. I just think that 2026 looks more like a really big year right now. So usually if people think that next year in your industry is going to be better and the year after that's going to be even better, then they start to move. So it doesn't surprise me that Cinemark would be going up or something. Somebody said, I followed Marcus for a while and the stock looks very cheap on a breakup slash some of the parts, but how do you unlock value with dual class shares? If it were single class, an activist would definitely come in. Do you believe that to be true? Oh, yeah, that's that's very possible, sure. And we talked about the Paramount decision before, so obviously companies who... It, there can be vertical integration in the industry now, so like Sony's buying Alamo Drafthouse, you, you could... people Companies can buy Cinemark and um, Marcus. Marcus is a family control company and everything, but they can make offers for either one to buy the whole thing, which obviously would be something that wasn't possible before what about five years ago something like that um yeah it used to be the impossible that studios couldn't buy theaters but now they can so there could be offers at some point for that sure Mm -hmm. got it cool well i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the focus compounding podcast if this is the first time you're joining us be sure to check out all of our content that we push out on the internet if you have a question that you'd like for us to go over on the podcast or maybe look at a stock on quick fs or a particular industry that we'd like us to go over uh, email it to me at andrew at focus compounding.com wherever you are listening or watching us here today be sure to hit the subscribe button so you will be notified every time that we upload a podcast and if you're interested in learning about our money management services, like I said at the beginning, be sure to reach out to me at Andrew at FocusCompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.